It's good to have you around. Um, this is now the second Q&A session on identification. And well, let's start with your questions. Okay, I have a question, please. Yes, hello. Okay, can you uh, explain to us the minimal system concepts, please, in the slide? You mentioned in the video the minimal system. Um, yes, um, the, the minimal system concept is something from the state space literature, and um, particularly the linear state space literature. Um, so in a state space system, you have a transition equation for your state variables and a transition equation for your control variables. And the minimal state space representation is the minimal dimension of your state variables that can completely replicate the dynamics of your model. Okay, and there are techniques to get this minimal state space system. And by default in Dynair, we don't do this because this minimal state space system very often has no economic interpretation. Okay, so in um, say the RBC model, you have capital and technology. Those are the state variables of your model. And for instance, consumption or output, those are the control variables of your model or investment. And those have clear economic meaning. Um, and for other models, um, you might get uh, so-called endogenous state variables. So maybe the, the lack of output becomes a state variable or some, some other um, that is a state variable in, in terms of what Dynair understands as state variable. So for Dynair, any variable you put in with a minus one or minus two or minus whatever lag becomes automatically a state variable. This is what we don't re sometimes refer to this as predetermined variables. And in the um, state space system literature, you can actually reduce these matrices such that you get a minimal state dimension. For most purposes, this is not really important for identification. Uh, Kumun Gerund Eng has you have used this to derive a, a, their rank criteria. Okay, but okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if that is sufficient because this, I mean, this state space literature starting with basically Kalman in the 60s, 70s, there, there are whole books written on this. Um, the engineering um, guys are, are doing very much or have done very much research here. And uh, as uh, macroeconomists, we were simply applying their, their concepts for our purposes in a sense, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I, I see, I see. I understand. Thank you very much, Professor. Any more questions? Okay, I would like to ask a question. Mm -hmm. I, good morning from here. Good morning. What time is it uh, at your place? This is 11, 11 okay. 40. Okay, well, yeah, good morning. <laughs> For me, it's uh, 6 p.m. or 7, almost 7 p.m. <laughs> yeah, okay. I guess this is on identification, right? This is uh, on identification, yes. Okay, so sometimes I still get to encounter this problem when I try to, I was going through the material before the class about identification, and at least I was, I began to understand some, some basics compared to what I've been doing. So I'm, I'm working currently on my thesis and in, in my estimation, right? I discovered that when, when I'm trying to estimate my model and then I use some observables, like when, I, when I'm estimating some of the parameters of my model with some certain observables, let me say, for example, I'm, using, I'm working on a labor market reform and then I have variables like, or I have data like unemployment, vacancy, I have like market tightness, I have, and then my main, my main variable there is like the labor market reform data. So if I use unemployment and say vacancy as my 
observe as my observables to estimate my equation, right? The the parameters actually differ when I also use some some combination of other variables, right? So so my question is this: when or how do you know which of these observables is best for you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that is one. Uh, of that is that is a, a very very good question. Um, uh, there is no definite answer to this. I mean, you're you're doing the the right thing. You're like the work you're doing. You're focusing on the labor market, so it makes sense that you do your estimation on labor market variables. Um, today, uh, Marco talked about this sensitivity toolbox, which is uh, very powerful to, to give you a feeling for which variables are most important driving the determinacy of your model, driving the impulse response functions of, of your model, uh, or which parameters um, influence which, which were variables. Um, so, so this is important. What you, um, what you can, of course, do is um, that this, this whole identification has basically two, is basically in two parts or two steps. There are some theoretical lack of identification properties. Okay, so this is what we have the identification toolbox for. This will guide you in a sense. If I use this observable, I cannot really um, identify this combination of parameters. So this is not a good choice. But maybe you can try out. You can try out different um, combinations of observables. Okay, so maybe do a brute force um, to, to be sure that you don't have any theoretical lack of identification. Then it comes to which variable is, um, is best or has, uh, contains most information. And this is where I, you are concerned about identification strength. And again, this is um, something that is totally model dependent. Okay, slight changes to your model might change the identification properties. So in one version of your model, it is uh, good to observe, have this variable or this one, one variable as observable. In another, it's actually better to have data on another one. And also there are data limitations. So you, you can't really observe all the variables. So you, you, have, you have all sorts of, of trade-offs. Um, if, you, if you're using, for instance, Bayesian estimation techniques and you have three shocks in your model, then you're, you cannot even do more than three observables. So you're already limited there as well. But you can try out all different combinations using this identification uh, toolbox. Okay, so you, you might be, uh, um, this is what I do. Okay, this is what I do if I have, I don't know, I'm, I'm allowed to have three observable variables, but I can find data for say at least five or six and or I can do some clever transformations then I simply try out which gives me the best identification strength, making sure that there is no theoretical lack of identification because this messes up everything, okay? Does this answer your, your question? Yes, yes, uh, that's very, that's very... Yeah. There is unfortunately, or uh, maybe I'm not aware, but unfortunately there's no general rule except yes. the choice of observables matters. This, this is definitely true. Yes. So thus far, what I've done, I've just submitted my other draft to my my thesis advisor. So what I did, try to do is to to do kind of like a sensitivity analysis for robustness check. So when I when I consider my main, let's say the main observables, let's say unemployment, vacancy, and labor market reform as my main observable for my estimation, then I try to do like a sensitive a, a robustness check in the appendix to show other combinations of observables and how the result differ. Sometimes I'm lucky enough, I see that the, the result do, actually does not differ a lot. And then okay. sometimes I see that there are some significant difference. So I just try to do that on the other side in case maybe a referee want to say, why don't you do this or that? So I just try to get a lot of combinations and then give explanations to the result just to see if it's like this, this is what the response for the parameters will look like. So that was what I've been able to do. Yeah, Thank but you. yeah, that's that's a good, that's a total, totally valid and good appro approach because you are working with your model, right? You're you're getting all those robustness checks. Maybe you won't put this in a paper, but if a referee uh, asks you, "Hey, what about this variable?" Then you you sort of have have a feeling, yeah, I can do this, but this will not have 
and um, this will not do good I already taking the best approach here. Um, so, so yes, this is basically you're, you're conducting already a sensitivity analysis. So really have a look at, at Marco's talk about the Dynair sensitivity toolbox, because this covers much more than just identification. Okay, any more question? Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't see that in the, in the chat. I have one question, how to recognize at the level of shocks that we are facing an ARP, MAQ or ARMA PQ process? at the level of um, shocks. Uh, so if I understand your um, question correctly, you uh, you don't know why, uh, well, if you, prior to estimation, you need to specify basically what kind of shock you have. Um, there is actually a work by, um, by, Alex, um, by Alex, by Alexander Meyer Gode, who um, has proposed to, um, or who, who has a asked the more or less the exact same question, um, what if we are more general in the shock, shock specification and simply estimate the ARMA PQ model when we es estimate with Bayesian methods? So it could be anything, any ARMA PQ. So uh, we like when we estimate the parameters, we also estimate the order of, the, of that. So you might want to check out um, that paper, I'm, I'm not sure whether it got published already, I think in economic letters, I'm, I'm not sure though. Okay, so, so maybe this is a good uh, reference there. But most of the times we as a modeler simply assume a certain ARMA structure for our shocks. It's up to you which one. Uh, most of the times you will find um, AR processes. Um, when you look, for instance, at Smets Wouters, they also have some ARMA processes there um, as well, but uh, I have not seen many pa pa papers that go above two legs, actually. I mean, this introduces much more um, parameters uh, that you need to estimate then. And an already an AR1 process is very good and approximated many uh, stationary processes. Hope this answers your questions. Again, have a look at uh, Alex's work. Um, Alexander Mayagoda, I will put his name in the chat. Okay, any more questions? I think we, I mean, we can go through the exercise together. All right, so here I wanted you to study the identifiability properties of the Ann and Schorfheide model that was also covered on Monday by Michelle. Okay, so this is a new Keynes model with Rotenberg nominal rigidities. I've laid out um, some intuition here. And basically, we want to consider three different uh, specifications for the monetary policy rule. So one, uh, so they all react to inflation deviations from the target, which is pi star, but they all they differ how they react to to the output gap. So this output gap is basically how does output deviate from the um, flexible from the output under flexible prices. Okay, so this is how does output deviate from the steady state. And this um, is how output deviates from its growth. Okay, and you were asked first, let's have a look at the baseline model with the flex price monetary policy rule and show that the model lacks theoretical identification. Um, and let's try to solve some obvious identification failures uh, and even have maybe have a look whether we can even solve this with non-lin considering a non, a second order approximation. Okay, now I've posted uh, this morning, unfortunately not yesterday, I've posted this morning a mode file um, for the Ann and Schorfheide model where again, using Dynair's pre-processing language, you can simply set this variable to one or two or zero, and it will automatically switch the monetary policy rule. But let's go through this model, okay? I've been declaring the model uh, variables. Again, this is the same model that Michel covered in his first lecture on Monday. Um, then I'm declaring observables. So this is 
basically output growth rate, annualized inflation rate, and annualized nominal interest rate. There are three shocks in the model, and we have three observables. So there's a monetary policy shock, a government spending shock, and a TFP shock. And there are a bunch of parameters. Okay, so there is, if you have a look at what I call them, there's the analyzed steady state real interest rate, analyzed target inflation rate, quarterly steady state growth rate of technology, then the inverse of the intertemporal elasticity of substitution tau, the inverse of elasticity of demand in the dixit stieglitz aggregation. Those are psi p, psi y are the Taylor rule parameters. The persistence in the Taylor rule um, is governed by this row. The persistence of the AR1 in government spending is governed by this parameter. TFP, the persistence of TFP is governed by this parameter. Those parameters are, I'm calling them standard deviation of the monetary policy shock, the government spending process, and TFP. Okay, phi is the Rotenberg adjustment cost parameter. I'm also having a parameter for steady state consumption to output and two auxiliary parameters, whatever that means. So here's the calibration. Okay, um, this is basically coming from the Ann and Schofheide paper. Um, most values. And now let's have a look again at the model equations. I'm using the Dynair's model local variables structure to comp compute a couple of auxiliary parameters and variables. So I have a parameter that is called gamma q but in my model equations, I'm using gamma. So this is just something like text substitution. Whenever I have a gum in my model equations, then it, the preprocessor will text substitute this into gum. Or whenever I have a B, uh, BT, which is better, the discount factor, the preprocessor will actually substitute this expression in. Okay, so Y star is my efficient um, output level. Uh, okay, and here is the monetary policy rule, okay? And you can change the value of, okay, again, going uh, here. If you change this value to one or two, then the preprocessor will either use this, this, or this. Okay, so basically here, I'm looking at the output gap in flex price, for, uh, or the output gap in terms of the flexible price deviations. Here, I'm looking at the output gap in terms of steady state deviations. And here, I'm looking at the output gap in terms of deviations from the long run growth rate. Hi, would. Hi, yes. Uh, um, so sorry for, inter for the interruption. Uh, taking advantage of, of this dot mod, I have a question that it's with a more regarding a more general concept. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I posted a question in the in the estimation of linearized models in Mattermost. Okay. But it's related about how to calibrate the variance and covariance matrix of the shocks. Um, yeah, how to calibrate the that variance and covariance matrix. For example, as I understood, for the technology shock process, we usually um, obtain or estimate the solo residual. And then we run a, a regression. We get a, the the regression estimates, and and we said that. But for the other variables, how do we know the? How do we get those estimates from the data? Uh, I mean, that's your answer. You estimate them from your data, sort of, right? Uh, that's like one way to do. Uh, you have a structural model. Um, I mean, Johannes showed you how to do Bayesian estimation. Um, tomorrow you'll see how to do method of moments estimations. That would be one way. You, you can simply estimate these parameters. But uh, since you're asking about a calibration exercise, um, I mean, you need, to do, you need to target something, right? Um, and it depends on, on the size of, of your model. The more shocks you have, the, the, the smaller the, the standard deviations of the shocks become because otherwise your, um, your variances of all those uh, variables might become quite large. Um, okay, so, so this is what, what I would do. Um, I mean, for, for say in the RBC model, where when we calibrate the parameters, we usually look at long run averages on, on means to, to calibrate most parameters. 
But when you calibrated the standard deviation, you need to also look at second moments of your data on those and to try to, to get to get these correct. Okay, so you really okay. um, or you you have a look at the impulse response functions because the standard deviation will will scale those impulse response functions. And if you have one impulse response function to a one standard deviation monetary policy shock and for an output jumps crazy like crazy, then there's might be something wrong either with your model or the, the value of the standard deviation. So that's okay. Yeah, uh, my question was was more like related to okay. I know that I want to estimate those those parameters, those standard deviations, and probably I will use Bayesian estimations. Mm -hmm. But I uh, um, it's recommended to calibrate first the model in order to get a a, a good solution before doing the Bayesian estimation. So if I don't really know the priors of those uh, standard standards before um, the estimation, how would be um, a guesstimate? You know. Uh, I mean, what most people do is, uh, um, unless you you completely develop it or you you have developed a complete new model, your model is already based on another model, say the Smets and Wouters model. Yeah. So what people most mm -hmm. of the times do, they take their prior or the, or their uh, posterior mean um, as initial value. Again, the, the standard deviations they will influence the dynamics of your model. The the the, how your impulse response functions, the, the size of those impulse response functions, but also the second moments of, uh, of your data. Yeah. Okay, so this is important. So you, you have to, um, I mean, this is why we say first calibrate your model to get intuition whether this makes roughly sense. And if you, if you get like crazy second uh, moments, so crazy standard deviations of output and crazy um, or for, uh, for labor or for, for wages, you get crazy... Uh, crazy high um, standard deviations of that, then uh, you might uh, lower or you must lower your standard deviations of your shocks or something is wrong okay. with your model. That could also be the case. But uh, again, most of the times, I mean, you're, you're maybe extending a, a model that is already that has been es estimated already. Um, and in a sense, it, all, it also comes down to try and error, right? Okay, right. So, so just to recap, the, the advice would be before doing the Bayesian estimation, calibrate the model very good or accurately in, in a sense, and then go, go forward to the Bayesian estimation, considering first and second moments at all. Okay, yeah. thank yeah, you so yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lawrence, I think you raised your hand. Do you, do you want to? Yes. Speak up, or so, uh, did you? Yeah. Uh, oh, I should open the chat maybe as well. Sorry. Okay. I just want to quick, quick hint. So your monetary policy specification. So this is like a loop. Is there a loop? Is that like a loop in there? Is that what it is? This is not a loop. This is. Okay. Um, uh, this is uh, simply um, like an if-else statement. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so uh, yeah, you, if you have never seen this notation here, uh, you should definitely check out um, Sebastian's uh, slides on the macro preprocessing. But this is, um, let's see, maybe I can. Dynair and Schauf Heide 2007 only. Macro, safe macro. Maybe this looks nicer. Okay, say so, um, I have in my and in Shawfight in my with all those crazy macro variables, I have set monpol to zero, and I want in my model block to have this equation for R star, okay? And if I'm, uh, what the preprocessor actually do is it does all those text substitutions. And you can by hand do this when you do um, save macro, and this is the mode file you get after the preprocessing. And I've saved this into a file called willy.mod. And if I then have a look into my mode file, into this preprocessed mode file, 
I don't get all those if else statements, but just the one I'm interested in. Does that make your, does that answer your question? You could actually do also for loops. Say you have the same Euler equation for um, the US, the Euro area, um, um, and uh, I don't know, uh, the rest of the world. Then you could uh, loop over this if you, uh, and simply add sub indices or something like that. So this is very powerful um, notation here. And I love to, 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 to do that. Okay, does this answer your question? I hope so. Yes, I have to study very yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is, okay. I have to study very well. I'm still kind of confused. I'm just checking materials. Okay. Now, actual model equations, basically. Excuse me, I have a question, please. Sorry, sorry yeah. for interrupting you. No problem, that's why, why we're here. Can you go just, just a, a bit up? In the mod five, mm -hmm. it just it just bit up. Yes, it's uh, no. It just in the indexation rule. Indexation rule. Yeah. You have the steady states. Steady state P. Can you explain us the purpose of this command? What it does and how to when when to use it? Please. Yes. Um, I'm using this. Well, let's have a look. Um, that was gamma P, right? I'm using it yes. here in the Phillips curve, where with when you have Rotenberg pricing, you have the inflation minus um, the steady state of inflation. Okay, if you don't assume any indexation rule, and the steady state operator lets enables you to tell Dynair, hey, compute the steady state and th that value that you computed for the steady state, please insert this into my model equations. Okay, so this is an operator. If you have, um, maybe let me consider again the, uh, hello. I love my computer here. Okay, let me just, let me see. So for instance, you have here in this rule that I want this to deviate, deviate from steady state. And to enter this in the model equation, you can simply use steady state of this variable. Okay, and this is basically what I also did here, steady state of y. Okay, so this okay, is how okay. you can, how can you, in, how you in, can insert a steady state value into your mode file. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. I understand. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Now, we have all our AR1 processes here and see that I multiply my exogenous variables with the stand with zig G and zig Z and zig R. Okay, those are my var variables that I can observe. Now I'm computing also the steady state model. Analytically, you can do this. And for the shocks, I'm assuming unit variances because of course I am scaling those with this zig G, zig Z and zig R parameters here. Okay. Now for identification, um, you can use the estimated params block to select those parameters that you want to check identification for. So in a sense, if you want to estimate these parameters, you should check identification of these parameters first. So it makes sense to you reuse this estimated params block. If you don't have one, then by default, we will check identification for all parameters and the standard errors of your shocks. So um, note that I have included the parameters for my that scale the standard error, but I also included the standard error shocks itself. So in the covariance matrix of my shocks. All right, then I'm computing the steady, um, checking whether this computes actually the steady state, uh, check the Blanchard and Kahn conditions, whether the dynamics are correct and model diagnostics, whether or not I'm using 
uh, I'm having any obvious errors here. Let's see. Nothing should. Nothing should be. Well, everything is looks okay. Okay, now let's simply run the identification command. So let's have a look at this graph. Okay, you have a bunch of parameters. They are all down here. And this is a log scale. So negative values are actually, this means zero. Okay, so those, uh, this is actually zero. And you can see that, well, C over Y, there is no sensitivity component for this parameter. And there's also no sensitivity component for omega. This means this parameter does not influence the likelihood, the curvature of the likelihood at all. Okay, so they're keeping all other parameters. I'm, I, I, I like check out whether or not when I change this parameter, how does my likelihood change? It does not change at all. Okay, so these parameters are here. I can already see those are totally not identified. What about the other parameters? Wow. Okay, so many parameters individually have an effect on the likelihood, on the curvature of the likelihood, but together there is like, um, so they offset each other. So several of those parameters offset each other. I can see this because I have no strength at all here. Those parameters seem to be quite uh, strongly identified. Okay, let's have a look into the output of the console. All right, let's uh, focus here, for instance, on the moments criteria. You, you, already, you also have the minimal system, uh, the reduced form. Okay, this, this tells you which, for the Jacobians, where are columns of zeros or which columns are perfectly linear, collinear, co or very close to collinear. Okay, and the reduced form, this one checks whether the um, the, the perturbation solution matrices, um, what is the influence of your parameters on the perturbation solution matrices? And this already tells you omega does not have any influence on that. And zig r and standard error of your shock, they are pairwise collinear. So it's the standard error of g and the zig g parameter and the standard error of z and the zig z parameter. Xi and rho z seems to be pairwise collinear and the monetary policy rules are even collinear with respect to all other parameters. So there's something already going on in, to, in your reduced form. The minimal system, basically, um, this is the, the one criteria of Kumanjaya and Eng, tells you the same story here. Um, the spectrum tells you also that this C over Y is not identified and the moments uh, also give you something. So you see slight difference in this criteria, okay? But this is just due to the numerical settings. And it actually indicated all those criteria together indicate quite, quite well where your problems are. So this model has some theoretical lack of identification. Let's see. Let's try to, to solve this. Let's have a first a look at omega, okay? Let's have a look. Where is omega? There it is. I declared it as a parameter. I give it a value of zero. And I have this in an estimated params block. But that's it. It's not in my model equations. OK, so this is like me being very quick. I forgot, or I have one parameter that completely is irrelevant. It does not enter my model equations at all. Of course, this parameter is not identified. Okay, so this is a very obvious lack of identification. So let me go back into my estimated params block. And I don't really want to check identification for this parameter. I don't want to estimate it because it has no meaning. Okay, now we've seen that C over Y is not I. Or, or, or no, let's go first to the standard errors here. Let's do those first. I am checking identification for 
the standard errors of my shocks and those ZIG parameters that multiply my shocks. So basically the scaling of my shocks and the standard error, they are multiplicative. And this, is, this tells me they are pairwise collinear. So if, say, if I am setting ZIG R to two and the standard error of my um, monetary policy sh shock to one, the actual uh, standard error will be two times one. But I can also do set this zig r to one and the standard error of eps r to two and one times two is also two. So this is perfect collinearity in the linear um, model, okay? So these are quite obvious. I don't, I could either um, not care about those parameters or I can fix these parameters whatever you want, you feel like. Let's do, I don't know, this for R. Let's also do that. And for G, we keep the parameter, but not the standard error here. Okay. And then you have phi and mu are pairwise collinear. Let's have a look where up phi and mu. So here's a problem, okay? Those phi, this phi parameter is actually a composite parameter of a bunch of other parameters of the intertemporal elasticity of substitution of the slope of the new Keynesian Phillips curve. So this is actually something that Johannes talk, talked about when you have the slope of the new Keynesian Phillips curve, it is actually a composite parameter of a bunch of other parameters. You cannot separately identify them. So I would also need to fix one of this, but because I, one of these values, because I really care about the slope of the new Keynesian Phillips curve, but not about, uh, I cannot distinguish uh, the, uh, the underlying parameters. Okay, so let me uncomment this as well. And let's see what happens. Okay, this looks better. Let's go back here in the console. Oh, I have forgotten about Xi and Rosette. Let's have a look. Where is this Xi parameter? Oh, quick one, please. Yes, go ahead. In, in your model, which I, I've not seen this before, which block actually bring this identification analysis out from your model block? This is just calling the command identification. Okay, so where do I have to declare? Okay, so after my estimation or calibration, I can just call identification out, is that possible? Yes, exactly, exactly. You have to provide values for the parameters and you can do this um, just uh, with this estimated params block or simply put in any values like you would do in a calibration exercise. So, okay, estimated. So, I like, mean, I mean, if, if you I do estimation, you have you have the same estimated params block, right? If you do estimation, Bayesian estimation, and then after this estimated params block, you would uh, run estimation data file, blah blah yeah. blah. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. And what you should do is call identification before your estimation command. Oh. Yeah. Or you, I mean, or you did uh, estimation, then you can also. And I mean, this is local identification. You can also then use the posterior mode or mean, for instance, if you're interested whether or not this, that these values are, um, how strongly they're identified, for instance. Then you could, then you should call identification after estimation. Okay, okay, I'll try that, thank you. Identification. Okay, now let's have a look. Where is Xi? Here, right here. So these two parameters are obviously collinear. Okay, there are so many combinations of Xi and Rho Z that will give me the exact same persistence level. So I did something really wrong in this mode file. Okay, this does not make sense. Okay, I have, let us fix Xi equals to one and do not estimate it or check identification about it as well. Okay.
Okay, now we are left from the moments here that those four parameters are still collinear with some other parameters. And this is something maybe not so obvious. Those are actually the parameters of my Taylor rule. Okay, this is the standard error of a monetary policy shock. This is uh, the inflation coefficient. This is the output gap uh, coefficient. And this is the persistence of my Taylor rule. So this is something that the toolbox found. You have to fix one of these variables. Okay, so maybe, uh, or in this model, those four variables together cannot be identified. There is another combination of values for the Taylor rule that will give you the exact same moments. And this is not good. So you cannot really infer. So if you estimate the model, you cannot really infer or pinpoint which values are the true values here. And this is not good. Now, so what was the exercise here again? We've shown that this mode file lacks some theoretical identification. We have tried or we have solved most of the, or we have solved the obvious identification failure. And now the question here is, what about an approximation to the second order? Um, does it maybe yield additional restrictions to solve uh, this, this non-obvious lack of identification? And you can check that simply by going ahead and running order equals two. By default, it's going to be order equals one. And this crashed, sorry. I'm running a new Mac with M1 chip and MATLAB is still not native to this and sometimes it crashes. Okay. Now, let's go again. So you can see that this is now based on the pruned state space system. So what I told about you in the video, this is using the pruned perturbation approximation at second order. And this takes a little longer than the first order approximation, of course. No, let's see. This is weird. Okay, from the moments, now everything seems to be uh, or is identified. And actually from the spectrum, it also should be identified. Uh, this crashed, maybe I need, didn't I? Just give me a second. Okay, let me see. Oh, I'm running the new version. Okay, so there might be uh, some issues I didn't fix yet. Anyways, um, actually this solves some of your problems here. Um, and something is happening here. Um, I'm running the, the unstable version. I think I changed something here that the spectrum can, um, the spectrum is not computed correctly. I think I've, I've worked on this. So uh, sorry about that because this, uh, I mean, I, I, I know this model, this is identified at a second order approximation. So the Taylor rule uh, is actually identified with a second order uh, perturbation approximation. Uh, but nevertheless, maybe this teaches you a lesson uh, or me a lesson, those um, checks will uh, give you sometimes different um, results. And this is most of the times due to numerical settings. And I've talked about this in the video. In particular, the spectrum um, is very sensitive how you 
normalize the Jacobian and also how to the method to find problematic parameters. And there is another one which works much better for the spectrum criteria, but uh, takes much longer. So we don't do this by default. Okay. Now let me go back to order equals one. Let's change the monetary policy rule. Okay, so let's go up and have a monetary policy rule that this cons um, where the output gap is measured as deviation from steady state output. Let's see whether we still have this identification problem that the monetary policy rule parameters are not identified. And we don't. Okay, so this is order equals one. So this is the linearized model by slightly changing your model that is, for instance, considering a different monetary policy rule, you get a different identification result. So actually your parameters are identified. And what about deviation from output growth? That is two. This also provides you means to identify all the parameters in your model. So have again, a look at the identification strength graphs. So here, the sensitivity, like for, always first have a look here, whether each parameter individually affects the information matrix. Okay, so the, the likelihood, the, the second derivatives of the uh, information matrix. And they do, okay? There might be tau, the effect of tau is not so large here, all right? So this is again, a log scale. Um, what about then the strength? So most parameters seem to be, or at least these parameters seem to be, the strength seems to be okay, but tau is actually only weakly identified. Let us again change the monetary policy rule to from steady, maybe from steady state output. Let's have a look, is there maybe an influence on the strength of identification as well? Yes, uh, I think it becomes worse, right? The, the, the blue bars are a bit lower. Oh, I didn't check the, the scale here. So you, yeah, anyways. So this, uh, I, I, the, the, the lesson I want you he to learn here is that slight changes to the, your model do have a measurable effect on identification, both on theoretical lack of identification, but also on the strength of identification. Okay, so this is the takeaway message from this exercise. Excuse me, I have a question, please. Uh, in the slide, you talked about the nonlinear. Uh, I asked uh, about the same question in the morning, in the morning session. Uh, so uh, the answer is uh, if, if you want to use the nonlinear model, you use order two or? Or you can even use order three, yes. Um, the, the identification toolbox will work at order one, two, and three. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Okay, and under the hood, what we do is we use perturbation approximation at orders one, two, or three. At, at orders two and three, we compute those moments from the pruned state space system. So we use pruning for this. So maybe this is something okay. that, uh, yeah, this is just for... for Maybe if you start out with these G models and then yeah, this is not so important. It's simply, a, it's also a valid approximation technique that enables you to compute those moments and the spectral density uh, quite uh, elegantly and analytically. This is the, yeah. Okay. So, so to let, me, let me sum up here. If you are concerned about estimating the Annan Schorfheider 2007 model, um, you have learned from Johannes how to do Bayesian MCMC methods on the linearized order equals one model, right? Um, we did cover also how to um, use, say, for instance, a particle filter to um, estimate with Bayesian methods models that are solved with second order or third order approximation techniques. Um, Okay, so, so these are your options. And if you are concerned about estimating this Annan-Schorfheide model, 
um, you could either do the order equals one, but then you really need to change your model. So for instance, change the monetary policy rule to the steady state or growth um, rule here, or the next exercises would also show you that if you include additional frictions, additional features to your model, this also solves this identification problem at order equals one. If you really want this flex price monetary policy rule in the baseline model, then you need to go to at least a second order approximation and estimate that model. And this is also something that Ann and Shaw Fide find in their, their original paper where they compare um, estimation to, of the linearized model with uh, the estimation of the model solved at second order. And the identification toolbox, before doing all the hassle with the, this estimation, uh, gives you already some insights what you can do or which model you should estimate. Okay, okay, I understand. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Um, there is a question in the chat. Is it possible to use the advanced option in point mode? Um, do you mean at order equals one or order equals two? So at order equals one, that's, uh, oh yeah, it should be at once equals one. Yes, you can, you can do this uh, fine. Um, maybe that's actually a very good idea. Um, let's consider again the, the one with the identification lag, okay? Where the monetary policy rule parameters are not identified and let's do an advanced. And so let's have a look at max dim cova group equals four. So. So let's have a look at those graphs again. That's actually a good idea here. So you see those heat plots, you will get much more heat plots. All right, this is the not identified model where the monetary policy rule parameters offset each other, okay? Each individually has an impact on the likelihood, but not together. Now the sensitivity bars using the derivatives, um, again, this is a log scale tell you the same story here. So this is negative values are actually zero, okay? Now let's have a look at those collinearity patterns. And you see that those, look at those dark red shades. So Psi P, the columns of Psi P can be perfectly replicated by the columns of Psi Y and the other way around. Let's have a look when we consider two parameters, the columns of Psi P and Psi Y, Psi Y can also be perfectly replicated by the standard error of the monetary policy shock and Psi P. So those two already play a role here. Now let's have a look at with three parameters, you still get those really dark areas here. So Psi P can be replicated by the standard error of Epsilon R by Psi Y and Rho R. And the, okay, so you have those dark red areas. What about four parameters? There are even more dark red shades because now whenever standard, the uh, standard error of um, the monetary policy shock and those Psi P parameters enter, this will give you many more problems here. And here are the values that are used for this. Okay, so you really have those ones. This is a problem. Okay, this really tells you there's perfect collinearity. Those four parameters cannot be estimated together. You either have to change your model or you have to fix at least, or you have to fix one of these parameters. Um, let's have a look at the singular values. Those are the largest ones. Those are not so interesting, but the lowest ones. Okay, you can see that Psi P, Psi Y, Tau, oh, well, the singular value is actually not so bad. But we have seen that tau is weakly identified. So this also indicates a bit weak identification of tau here. 
okay, so there's something wrong with your monetary policy rule. The identification toolbox really hints towards this. So you need to, to uh, be aware of that. Change your model again slightly. Uh, consider maybe other uh, observables. This might change the identification properties as well. Okay. Um, yeah, the exercise goes even uh, or tells you so, some more things you can do to solve this identification uh, problem by introducing even more frictions or uh, features to your model, like an indexation rule or, um, uh, yeah, like an indexation rule, for instance. But uh, yeah, you can most likely do this and try this out at home. Or I've given you also a reference where we analyze this model in quite some detail uh, in the paper. Okay, are there any questions regarding uh, this uh, toolbox? Yes, I have a question, please. Uh, uh, when you are doing a study, uh, which uh, uh, toolbox have you have you to use first the identification toolbox or the sensible global sensitivity analysis toolbox which one should we use first when you are doing a, a real study um i mean prior be, before you do estimation you should do identification for this you need to to have a feeling for your model parameters right uh, and then the sensitivity toolbox is very uh, very important to know which parameters govern the determinacy and indeterminacy region. So in a sense, if you do a real study, um, then uh, I would start with the sensitivity toolbox. And before you go to estimation, then run the identification toolbox. And after your estimation, I would actually run the identification toolbox again on the, say, the posterior mean. Okay, okay, I understand. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, Professor, do we have this like this file in any of the material you, you gave us? The, this file? Yeah. Um, yes, I uploaded this to the Dynair Summer School Wiki this morning, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Under the problem set? The, the problem set, the exercises is uh, uploaded there as well. And the, the, no, base, uh, the, the baseline the... mode file is there as well. Okay. Let me see. Okay, any more questions? So I'm happy to answer any more questions you have in uh, on Mattermost in the in the chat. Feel free to to reach out to me by by email or uh, in the Dynairs forum. Um, and I hope this uh, was insightful for you. I would, if no one's objecting, I would then close this session.